Hi folks, welcome to Bear Mountain today. Today we're going to be doing a little bit of scythe work. Uh, we're going to be switching from our ditch blade that we normally do. We did a video on this a long time ago about how we were cutting grass and clearing some areas. And this time we're going to be clearing out blackberries. So we're going to be using our brush blades. So why don't you stay tuned and we'll show you how to do it. Okay, to give a quick rehash of things, these blades here are attached to the wooden handle, which is called the snathe, using a D-ring. So what we're going to do is take the old ditch blade off, which is the one we were using for cutting grass and light weeds and things of that nature. So we do that by, yeah, loosening. <laughs> Cut. And then the wind comes up. Okay, this was our first time we were using this for the season, and I'd left the blade on the snathe over the winter time. So the bolts got a little tight. So. I had to cut because there was swearing and grimacing. <laughs> and But now what? that we have it loosened up, now we can take off the ditch blade, which is kind of the first step of what we're trying to do here. And it's kind of the key to do this is to loosen both bolts kind of on a equal basis so one doesn't get left too tight and you only got to loosen this enough to get the blade out holding the blade and then it comes off and the snathe looks in pretty good shape there's no cracks or anything of that nature so we're in good shape so we're just going to set that aside now just to give a lesson and this is the truth for all scythe blades. The point is called the toe. The back end here, the long wide part where the blade comes down to, the, to, to its edge is called the beard. Where it comes out of the blade and is attaching to what's called the tang. This part here right at the curve is called the heel. And then this rib right here at the top is either called the chine or a back rib. So it's kind of a bent piece of steel over the top that gives the blade itself its strength. Now all scythe blades have these parts. It's just a matter of angle of how it was made for what they're going to be cutting it for or length of the blade will change or width of the beard will change. The longer the beard, stronger the chine, the tougher the blade can cut. So now let's go to our brush blade. Okay, we haven't used the brush blade yet this year and when we took it off I've noticed and that we have a few areas here that have to be kind of peened out and roughed out because in previous use there's been little dings and nicks and things in the blade itself so this is just a good thing to do if you haven't used it in a while is to go through the peening process question yes the um difference be besides the length of the blade for this brush blade is it stronger to cut through brush yes the other one is taking a thinner like it's good for grass because it's a little thinner. Right. Okay. So when you look at this blade, it is a little bit thicker. The whole blade. The whole blade. But the majority of it is the beard, the length, the width of the blade is much uh, greater. So a grass blade would typically be thinner at the beard and would go out to typically a longer point. And the whole idea behind a grass blade is that people want to take big swings and they want to get uh, a swath that's probably seven, eight feet uh, as they go. So typically a grass blade for cutting uh, hay or, or straw or wheat or whatever would be probably 36 inch. So a, a really good size blade. This blade is 45 centimeter or 18 inch. I mean, this idea is to cut brush. Heavy-duty stuff. This can cut saplings and brush 
up to three quarter inch. Okay. Uh, really pretty easy. Okay. And this blade, there is a difference also too in the brush blade from a ditch blade or a grass. In this case, the bevel of the cutting edge is not as honed down and thin. So if you had a thinner blade, like if you were trying to use a grass blade to cut brush, you'd quickly trash the edge of the blade because you, what you're looking for is a, is a tougher edge that's gonna go through something tough. It's, it's slicing still, but it needs, it can't be thin, it's gotta be thicker, and that thicker allows the blade uh, to last longer between, um, you know, you, you, if you were using a grass blade, you'd be taking it off and taking out the dings and, and you, you could actually even break the blade uh, if you were trying to cut things that were too, too, too thick. The strength of the steel, uh, you would end up with cracks in the blade if you were using a grass blade to cut, cut brush. So this also in the peening process is different than a standard ditch or a grass blade. In, in the peening process of a, of a ditch blade that we have, uh, it's a two-part process. So there's actually um, a, a rough peening, which would give you a, a thick bevel like you would use only for a brush blade, and then a second peening, which pounds the metal out even a little further and a little thinner to give you a finer edge to hone. Let's see that. Okay. Okay, the repair process of a blade, uh, a lot of people kind of freaks them out. You know, once they use it, they go, oh my God, how am I going to get it sharp again? Uh, um, or or I've, I've hit something and I've, you know, bent the blade, uh, the edge of the blade, and uh, oh, now I've got, a, I've got a divot in it. Well, that's where these mill files come in. And basically what you want to do is you want to, if you find an area that has a roughness to it or a chunk of the metal is maybe for whatever reason got busted off you're gonna use this file to you know keeping it at the angle of where your chine or your back rib is and you're gonna kind of work and just try to take some of the metal off and work around the rough spot until you get it kind of evened out it's not so much that you're trying to grind the thing down or you would really wouldn't want to use a power grinder on it either because it's important to keep your angle. And so that's just, you know, a real easy thing to do. So it's important to have one of these guys on hand when you're, when you're repairing and peening a blade. Okay, so let's peen this guy up. And then what we can do is then we'll, we'll hone the blade after. And so first step in the peening process is make sure you got, this is a jig and you want to make sure you're using the right bevel. This bevel, um, it, the jig comes with two bevels. And the first bevel, which is your roughest bevel or the, um, not the finest angle on it, but is, is more of a, a rough bevel, is got a one line on it. And then the finishing bevel that you would use on a ditch blade or a, or a, a, a grass blade is got two lines on it for an even finer peening out. So this is really a pretty simple process. You want to lay the blade flat starting from the beard. Put your jig top down on it and then just start So the idea is you want to kind of use your, your legs maybe to guide it a little bit but you're trying to keep it as flat on the actual jig as you can make it. Now what you may be noticing is what I'm doing is I'm using my left hand on the tang itself and I'm trying to guide the blade through the jig itself. Sometimes if you had an area that you repaired and you used the file on it, you may want to go back over it 
again. Just to make sure you got it pounded out. So the question is, how do you know if you've got it peened out well enough? Well, really what I look for is the strength of the line we showed you, and we'll show a picture back in the inside of it, but you can see that there's a definite now where the metal has been pounded down and pushed out. And that process actually hardens this edge such that now when we go to hone it with our stone, um, it's gonna hold uh, sharpness longer. So the actual pounding process actually helps not only push the metal out, but it actually gives it extra strength. So let's go on to the next step, which is honing the blade. Okay, this is a nice carrying case. I tried the metal one before and this is a plastic one and actually it works much better. Uh, it's pretty durable, UV resistant, and it's got a nice clip to put on your belt buckle. This holds your water solution. Also too, it's just as a tip to help keep the blade a little, or the stones a little cleaner. Uh, put just a dab, maybe like a quarter teaspoon in your, uh, your holder here of uh, distilled white vinegar. Uh, kind of helps, doesn't dissolve the stone, but just kind of helps keep it a little cleaner. It uh, really does make a difference. Okay, there's two types of stones. There's a coarse stone, which I'm holding in my right hand, and that's used for honing the blade uh, once you've done your peening. So you would use this actually to kind of for your first set of honing you would do on any blade, whether it's a brush blade, a ditch blade, or, or a grass blade. It just kind of gets the, uh, the angle uh, set that you're honing to. And, but it also uh, can take off, particularly on a fine blade, like a, a grass blade. You have to be careful with it. Don't use it too much because it's going to take off more. Think of this as like coarse sandpaper. It may not feel that way to your bare skin, but on the blade itself, it actually removes um, more uh, per stroke than say the finer blade, which I'm holding in my left hand. Uh, not blade actually, excuse me, stone. Um, these are both natural stones and you can tell the difference between the two if you were confused by they leave the coarse stone a rough side and the smoothing stone, which is your finishing stone in my left hand has actually a smooth side to it. Uh, occasionally what you might wanna do is wash these guys off when you're done with them. Uh, remove any loose grit or anything like that. And again, you can use the distilled white vinegar in the actual carrying uh, holster, uh, which kind of helps keep it clean in between. So the next step here is we're only going to use the coarse stone for the brush blade. We're not going to use the, the fine because we're only going for a, a really tougher edge, uh, not one that's honed to a, a, a razor sharp. It's gonna be pretty sharp, but it's not gonna be as sharp as a grass blade. So let's use this one. Okay, you just wet your stone, and you wanna make certain that it is wet when you're using it. Don't use it dry. And you're putting the stone, you're using this back rib as a gauge to your bevel. So what you're doing is you're going down in strokes and try to make it as evenly as possible, going down the length of the blade. If you notice, I'm using the toe of it in the actual um, wood stump that I use, or 4x4 four four I'm using for my, my peening jig. You can use it on anything. You stick it into a piece of wood and just... The whole idea is you're going down the length of the blade. And if you notice, the stone is kind of cut to fat in the middle to fine at a point, so it all works out quite well. Now the question somebody may ask is, well, how do you know when you're done? Well, with a brush blade, it doesn't take as much honing as you would think. Um, and it's already, you can feel it on the finger. You, if you push your finger on it, you can kind of feel it. You don't want to cut yourself, 
but you can kind of feel that it's pretty sharp. And if you look at it and you say, I don't see any rough edges or anything of that nature. So it doesn't take too much. And that's about it. And the last thing you're going to want to do is check the back side to see if there's any curling back of the metal. Because a honing on, and even when you're doing this in the field, you definitely want to make sure that you take your wetted stone and just give it a clean swipe on the back of the blade. What that does is it removes any kind of metal that might have been, you know, super fine and just kind of pushed over a little bit and kind of finishes setting the blade. Okay, the last step is to take the blade after you've done the initial honing of it and it's uh, in good shape is to put it back on the snathe. And in this case, uh, the previous blade we had on there, the metal on the tang was actually thinner. So we wanna make certain that we have our uh, lock bolts on our D-ring as far open as we can get them without causing too many problems. So that tang will slip in there nice and nice and easy. So sometimes you got to be aware of that, that sometimes it gets just a little bit thicker. Now the tang has a nub on it and that nub actually goes in the hole in the snake. So that's how you know that you've set it correct. So then what we're going to do is you're going to hold that. Okay. Once we've got the D-ring slipped over the tang, we want to make sure that the D-ring is placed just about a half inch or so from the end of the snake. And then that puts it pretty much right in the middle of the tang itself. And then what we're going to do is we're going to start locking down the, uh, the nuts or screws. And then before we tighten it all the way down, we're going to check what's called the hafting angle and what that is is that's the angle that the blade is relative to the snape itself so you can actually kind of move the blade adjust it a little bit here and there which changes the effectiveness of your cutting quite a bit all right i got it loosely tightened just one more turn here yeah. okay the hafting angle is, let me adjust this here, okay, is the angle that the blade is going towards the inside. If it's all the way out, it's going to change how easy or difficult it is to cut, okay? Usually the hafting angle adjusted all the way in, as you can see, see it has some movement. You can move it in or out, but I prefer to have it all the way in because I'm cutting in a swath back towards me and then around the front. So it makes for an easier cut when the hafting angle is tight. And that's all the way in. Now some people, depending on what they're cutting, will adjust it uh, to what makes sense to them. Uh, I guess I'm not that refined yet that I can determine that kind of thing. So we're going to tighten this up all the way in with the hafting angle set as tight as I can make it. Just kind of alternating between the two screws until we have it all tightened up. Now as an important safety tip that I violated, I violate this all the time myself, is you really ought to probably wear gloves when you're working around the base of these blades. Um, I guess what can I say? I make rules, but I don't follow them. It's not a good thing. And yet there's gloves right behind yeah, you. there's gloves right behind me. <laughs> okay, so she's tightened up. Uh, the D-ring is where it's supposed to be. Everything is good to go. We got our stone with us, so we can do a little more honing if we get down there in the field. Let's go cut something. All right, so this area is... Uh, a well, disaster. Re return back to nature, which for us is blackberries, and it takes about 2.3 nanoseconds of not mowing it to get there. I exaggerate, but not much. Not much. And so what we're going to do is the uh, first step into cleaning this up is we're going to whack these blackberries down and kind of 
work this area right here. So we're just going to show you how the blade works. Um, we did hone it when we were, I heard something in the brush. Oh, great. <laughs> <laughs> ah! So the first thing we're going to do is just kind of give it a quick hone uh, and then we'll start cutting. Why do you use a, bre uh, a scythe when in the background you can hear that somebody's mowing? I can't hear you. I'm too busy mowing my blade. Uh, I'm using the scythe on it basically because um, it's really a difficult area in terms of uh, if it's not cleaned out to get you know power equipment up here. Uh, it's pretty mucky down below so in order like for our tractor to get up here with a brush hog um, it would probably get stuck before it actually gets here itself you know so, somebody said that our place was so organized not here huh? depends on which way you turn the camera our tunnels are organized this not so much well someday so anyway um, we're gonna start cutting and We'll see where we go. Now this will cut some grass. It's just not efficient to cut grass with it because the blade is so short. But uh, the whole idea is that we start taking these blackberries out. Um, so let's get at it. The nice thing about blackberries is they're intertwined all over the place. So it takes a while to find where the actual the plant is. The worst thing about blackberries is that they are kind of viney, so they do tend to uh, have multiple things that need to be cut to get one pass through to get a cut. Do you find this fatiguing? Hmm? Do you find this fatiguing? Not really. Uh, the doing most of the work. Do you find it fatiguing that you have to do this every year because the blackberries keep every coming? Year Cut them off pretty easy once you kind of figure out where the uh, base of the plant is. Unless these guys are, these Himalayan blackberries are notorious for every branch that sends up in the spring the arch over in the summer and by fall the tip of it will actually form new plants if it t touches the ground so these guys can quickly take over an area with like lickety split like behind you yeah Is this a good time of the year to do this? Yeah, because they're not really growing. 
at this point they're they're kind of dormant so and they've lost a lot of the leaves so it's i guess it would have been much easier just to mow the area and not let it happen but what we'll do is we'll pile these guys up and uh probably just this thin stuff will just compost but anything thicker uh what we may do is make biochar out of it or something never hurt to also carry a pair of clippers just in case you want to get rid of something that's hanging over your head. But this is kind of the basics of it. Um, one last thing to check though is typically when you put this D-ring back on until you've maybe used it a little bit, sometimes you have to go back through with your Allen wrench and just make sure that you're still tight and that your hafting angle is still good, which it is. Sometimes it loosens up. But other than that, um, it's just now a matter of just, you know, working your way through and cutting the stuff up. So how long will you do this um, per day? Um, you know, I've kind of gotten to the point where I can do it for two or three hours without and it really, it, what it really ends up being is it's not so much I have to quit because it's fatiguing. It's, it's more I've got to quit because i got to go do other things. But it will become, this is the time of year, will it will become what you do on a daily basis for a while. Yeah, I get out in the morning and try to hit it and uh, just keep chopping away at it. And like I said, this stuff here will probably take me, well, I don't know, four or five hours to do this. I don't know how big this area is, probably 100 foot by maybe 100 feet going back. And it'll take, uh, yeah, it'll take probably six to eight hours to get that whole thing done. And then, you know, a lot of the other times, once you cut it, is piling it up and, uh, you know, getting it burned off. And then okay, took about an hour, and it looks like roughly I was able to go about 30, 40 feet deep by about probably it's kind of an odd shape but i think it's probably 60 feet long and 50 60 foot long on the other side so i'm going to say it's 50 feet by approximately 30 feet wide so let's just say for argument's sake 30 by 30 wow that can't be right is that really true 900 square feet so i did about a thousand square feet let's just say a thousand square feet in about an hour Got it all cut down and brought it back down to here into a windrow. As you can kind of see, uh, compared to my scythe, it's roughly about probably three foot high. And it's about, I don't know, nine or ten feet long and probably about three or four foot wide. So a lot of biomass there. So that's what can be done in about an hour uh, with the scythe. So it's really a good tool to use in an area where you can't get power equipment into, and it does a pretty good job. So anyway, just wanted to say, uh, you know, how do we use the brush blade, and what is a brush blade, and how to work it, and wanted to give you guys an example of, of uh, what we do with it. So uh, thanks for joining us today, and as always, stay safe out there, and have a good day. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.